Hello everyone, I'm San Tanaka. Thank you for your time. Today, I will be installing Ubuntu 2404 desktop on an actual machine. I have downloaded the ISO image for Ubuntu 2404 and written it to a USB drive to create a bootable media. Currently, I am booting the computer from this USB drive. Upon hearing this, some of you might think as follows. Is that necessary for the installation? Please show me how to create a bootable USB drive. Yes, let's start with that first. Let's learn this process together. First, visit the official Ubuntu website and download the latest version of the Ubuntu ISO file. The ISO image of Ubuntu is about 6 GB. So prepare a USB drive with a capacity of more than 6 GB. It is recommended to use a USB drive with at least 8 GB. If you do not have a USB drive, or if your drive does not have enough capacity, it is also possible to install via a network. Next, use a free tool called Rufus to write the downloaded ISO file to a USB drive. This handy tool transforms the USB drive into a bootable media, allowing the computer to boot directly from this USB. Make sure to select the ISO file you downloaded earlier as the boot portion. Oh, it looks like there is a new version of Rufus available. It would be wise to update to the latest version here. During installation, you will be asked about partitioning and target systems. But unless you have a specific reason, the default settings should be fine. This is because Ubuntu automatically applies what it deems the most appropriate settings, making this method recommended for beginners. When writing the Ubuntu ISO image to a USB drive, all data on the USB drive will be erased. If you have important files saved on the USB, please back them up beforehand or use another USB drive. Incidentally, since I did not have a large capacity USB drive, I wrote the ISO image to an empty DVD to boot. To boot the computer from the USB drive, you must first enable USB boot in the BIOS or UEFI settings. When starting the computer, you usually enter the BIOS setup screen by pressing the delete or F2 prime key. In the setup screen, find the boot menu and set the USB device as the top priority in the boot order. When installing Ubuntu, note that the desktop version might not include all necessary language settings during the installation process. For the server version, as my needed language was not available, I chose English and later installed the language pack. During the installation process, I chose Wi-Fi to connect to the internet to obtain the latest updates. It is possible to install Ubuntu without an internet connection, but if connected, you can simultaneously perform system updates and install necessary packages during the installation. I kept most settings default, but since this computer has a GPU, I also opted to install third-party drivers and software. Indeed, it seems a good option to include this when you have an NVIDIA GPU. Oh, there seem to be three options. Which one should we choose? If you want to completely remove Windows and use only Ubuntu, I recommend deleting all existing Windows partitions during the installation and installing Ubuntu on a clean slate. In that case, the Windows Boot Manager will also be erased and the system will solely run Ubuntu. Then, you will first completely erase the disk and afterward install Ubuntu. During this process, you can choose to use LVM, which allows for more advanced disk management. Using LVM enables flexible management of disk partitions such as resizing and easy future expansion. However, if the disk space is limited, the benefits of using LVM might not be significant. LVM stands for Logical Volume Manager, which simply put, as a tool for managing logical volumes in Linux systems. If disk space is limited, it may be difficult to fully utilize LVM's flexible management and expansion features, so opting for a simpler partition configuration might be easier to manage and more efficient. As I was explaining, the installation has completed, so I will press the Restart Now button. After installation and pressing the Restart button, some systems may automatically attempt to bolt from the internal disk. 
However, to ensure the next boot is from the internal disk, I recommend removing the installation media. In the case of this computer, it booted from the internal disk without having to remove the installation media. After installing Ubuntu, the system may restart several times during the first boot to automatically optimize settings. This ensures that necessary drivers are installed and system updates are properly applied. Indeed, I did restart several times, but I have cut that part out of the video. I have installed OBS Studio, so I can now display my desktop screen. After installing Ubuntu, one of the first important checks to make is whether the NVIDIA display drivers are properly installed. You can open the terminal and check this with a command. According to the command, it shows CUDA 12.2. Even if it shows CUDA, it doesn't necessarily mean that the CUDA toolkit is installed, right? That's right. It took me 10 years to understand this, so I'll explain it now. When you enter the command to check if the CUDA toolkit is actually installed, it will display the command needed for installation if necessary. You can install it by executing the displayed command, but there is a concern I have. Since Ubuntu 2404 has just been released, it seems that the corresponding drivers are not yet available on NVIDIA's official page. I will investigate this further and compile the information. Ubuntu comes with a basic system and some standard applications, but the CUDA Toolkit is not included among them. The CUDA Toolkit is an advanced development tool necessary for specific purposes, such as GPU-based programming and deep learning, and must be installed separately as needed. Upon hearing this, some might think like this. I bought a Windows PC, what about this? Except in special cases, the majority of standard consumer PCs do not come with the CUDA toolkit pre-installed. Also, the CUDA version displayed by the NVIDIA SMI command indicates the version of CUDA that the NVIDIA driver supports, but this does not necessarily mean that the CUDA toolkit is installed. We need to be cautious with the version display by the CUDA commands. This is especially important when multiple versions of CUDA are installed. The displayed version only represents the maximum version of CUDA that the driver supports. Since it is not yet installed on Ubuntu, I will actually check it on Windows. The CUDA version, shown in the command prompt, represents the version supported by the NVIDIA driver which in this case supports up to 12.4. However, if the folder shown in the video exists and contains files, the actual installed version of the CUDA toolkit is 11.8. This means that an older version remains installed and has not been upgraded. This was an oversight, quite educational. In Ubuntu, the CUDA version shown by NVIDIA SMI represents the latest version supported by the NVIDIA driver. However, the version of CUDA Toolkit included in the Ubuntu repository is not necessarily the latest. I will briefly summarize the difference between CUDA and CUDA Toolkit. Simply put, CUDA refers to the concept or architecture, while the CUDA Toolkit is a package that includes tools and libraries for actual development using the CUDA architecture. Many modern applications and services such as AI-powered image generation tools like Stable Diffusion need to process large amounts of data and produce results in real time. To do this efficiently, it is necessary to install the CUDA Toolkit. This toolkit includes the compilers and libraries needed to develop CUDA programs. Therefore, understanding the basic concepts of CUDA can greatly assist both the installation process and subsequent usage. Understanding the basic concepts can be very helpful when you try something on your own. With this knowledge, it seems I might be able to install AI-related applications. I look forward to seeing you again. Goodbye.